Hi, and welcome to episode 74 of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, the editor at ToqueSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First of all, let's take a look at our Toke Signals Bud Pick of the Week. We have some buds in making here. This plant is a sativa called Pure Africa. She's two weeks into flower, and as you can see, she has big plans. Let's do the news now, shall we? In the United States this week, the Surgeon General says marijuana can be helpful. That's kind of a big deal considering what Surgeon Generals in the past have said about pot. U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy has joined the growing number of top medical professionals and organizations favoring the reform of mar marijuana to allow access to cannabis for medicinal purposes. We have some preliminary data showing that for certain medical conditions and symptoms that marijuana can be helpful, Dr. Murthy said, and that comes from the communications director at the Drug Policy Alliance. I think we have to use that data to drive policy making, the Surgeon General said, and that's a significant statement. Despite the legalization of medical marijuana in 23 states, the federal government still insists that cannabis is a Schedule I controlled substance meaning it has a high potential for abuse and no medical value. It's an interesting study that's unfolding in our country right now, an interesting story, according to Dr. Murthy, and we have to see what the science tells us about the efficacy of marijuana. And I think we're going to get a lot more data on that as more states legalize cannabis for medicinal purposes, he said. Patients in states without medical marijuana laws have no legal access at all to this therapeutic substance. Even in states where medical marijuana has been legalized, Patients and providers are vulnerable to arrest and harassment from federal law enforcement agents. Bill Clinton's Surgeon General, Jocelyn Elders, spoke out about the potential benefits of legalization back in 1993 when she said, I do feel we'd markedly reduce our crime rate if drugs were legalized. Elders now sits on the Drug Policy Alliance Honorary Board. Last week, two major health organizations released updated policies on medical marijuana, as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Public Health Association both backed more research. Murthy's comments will only add to the growing momentum to increase the number of states with medical marijuana laws, support and improve existing state medical marijuana programs, protect medical marijuana patients, and to end the federal ban on medical marijuana so that all patients have safe access to quality medicine, according to the Drug Policy Alliance. This week, a new study was released showing daily marijuana use doesn't change the brains of teens or adults. It's a repeating pattern, you may have noticed. Last year, the mainstream press gave lots of attention to a study suggesting that daily marijuana use could cause abnormalities in the brain. But now that new research using better techniques indicates that claim simply isn't true, it doesn't get nearly as much press coverage. The authors of this new study, daily marijuana use is not associated with brain morphometric measures in adolescents or adults, which was published in the latest issue of the Journal of Neuroscience, suggests that alcohol use was actually responsible for the brain changes found in previous studies. An abstract of the study describes how scientists could not replicate recent research that claimed cannabis use is associated with volumetric and shape differences in subcortical structures. The MRI brain scan reports of 29 adults and 50 adolescents who were daily cannabis users were compared with MRI scans of the same numbers of adult and teen non-users of cannabis. Groups were matched on a critical confounding variable alcohol use to a far greater degree than in previously published studies, according to the abstract. We acquired high-resolution MRI scans and investigated group differences in gray matter using voxel-based morphometry, surface-based morphometry, and shape analysis and structures suggested to be associated with marijuana use, as follows, the nucleus accumbens, amygdala, hippocampus, and cerebellum. No statistically significant differences were found between daily users and non-users on volume or shape in the regions of interest. The lack of differences in the brain was so striking, there was no sign of even a modest effect, according to the research team. Also this week, U.S. Congress looks at expanding medical marijuana access for veterans. U.S. House Representative Earl Blumenauer 
a Democrat from Oregon, and eight bipartisan congressional co-sponsors on Tuesday introduced the Veterans Equal Access Act making a concerted federal effort to allow our country's veterans to become medical marijuana patients in states where it's legal. This bill, which is modeled after similar legislation introduced in November, would simply allow Veterans Affairs physicians to discuss and recommend medical marijuana to their patients, a right enjoyed by physicians outside of the VA system. Post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury can be more damaging and harmful than injuries that are visible from the outside, said Representative Blumenauer in a prepared statement, and they can have a devastating effect on a veteran's family. We should be allowing these wounded veterans access to the medicines that help them survive and thrive, including medical marijuana, not treating them like criminals and forcing them into the shadows. It's shameful. The Veterans Equal Access Act is co-sponsored by a balanced mix of eight members on each side of the aisle. In 2011, the Veterans Health Administration issued a directive which said, VHA policy does not administratively prohibit veterans who participate in state marijuana programs from also participating in VHA substance abuse programs, pain control programs, or other clinical programs where the use of marijuana may be considered inconsistent with treatment goals. However, in addition to giving wide discretion to continue discrimination against veterans, the policy also forbids VA physicians from issuing medical marijuana recommendations to their patients. For many veterans, their VA physician is their primary care physician, and they have no need to go outside of the VA system for health care. In fact, since more than a million U.S. veterans are at risk of homelessness due to poverty, they don't have the option to pay for private physicians in order to meet their health care needs. As a result, veterans are either denied critical pain medication and other pharmaceuticals because of their medical marijuana use, or they are forced by their VA physicians to go without an important and adjunct therapy. Millions of Americans suffer from PTSD and chronic pain, but our veterans are even more adversely affected by these conditions, and yet we fail to treat them with the same level of respect, said Mike Lizewski, Government Affairs Director with Americans for Safe Access, a medical marijuana advocacy group. Veterans must be given the same rights and health care options that we give other Americans, especially where medical marijuana is concerned. Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access applauds Congressman Blumenauer for standing up for the doctor-patient relationship by reintroducing the Veterans Equal Access Amendment, said Veteran for Medical Cannabis Director Michael Krawitz. In every state of our nation, disabled United States military veterans stand to gain from this legislation because every veteran deserves the best medical care. This requires an open discussion of all treatments available. We trust our doctors to prescribe morphine. We should also trust them to appropriately recommend cannabis. The men and women who served in Iraq and Afghanistan have made tremendous sacrifices for our country, said Dan Riffle, Director of Federal Policies for the Marijuana Policy Project. They deserve every option available to treat their wounds, both visible and hidden. If VA doctors are confident that medical marijuana would improve their patients' quality of life, they should be able to recommend it to them in states where it's legal. Republicans are really stepping up on this issue, as evidenced by the list of co-sponsors, Riffle said. Medical marijuana is becoming a bipartisan issue on Capitol Hill which makes sense given the level of public support behind it. This isn't about being liberal or conservative, Riffle said. It's about being sensible and compassionate. Researchers were granted permission last year to study the effects of medical marijuana on post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But that study has been plagued with setbacks, including the University of Mississippi, which is the sole supplier of research-grade cannabis in the U.S. to the federal government, saying it was unable to provide the requested strains as well as the untimely and questionable firing of lead researcher Dr. Sue Sisley from the University of Arizona. A study published just this month in the Annals of, Epide Annals of Epidemiology found that the suicide rate among veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan is 50% higher than the national average. A study published last year in the American Journal of Public Health found that in states that passed medical marijuana laws, there was a subsequent statistically significant reduction in suicide rates. And in March of last year, the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs published a study that found participants who used inhaled marijuana reported an average of 75% reduction in PTSD symptoms. In Washington State, an interesting situation where Washington's legal I-502 pot stores say, if you can't beat the competition, have them outlawed. This press blitz began months ago, and it became absolutely inescapable once 2015 started. Article after article has appeared in the mainstream press about the supposed need to extinguish 
medical marijuana dispensaries in Washington State. The largely untold side of this story is that of mom and pop marijuana businesses serving seriously ill patients that are seen as the competition and are thus slated for extinction by greedy I-502 interests. Supporters of folding medical marijuana into the recreational system claim that safe access would be unaffected by suddenly doubling, tripling, or quadrupling the price patients have to pay, even while reducing the number of safe access outlets in Seattle, for instance, from about 200 to about half a dozen. Among the more shrill attackers of what they claim are untaxed, unregulated businesses are Seattle City Attorney Pete Holmes and ACLU Attorney Allison Holcomb the author of Initiative 502. Most activists who've been paying attention have known for years that neither Holmes nor Holcomb is a friend of the medical marijuana community. Instead of upping their game in a competitive environment, the I-502 recreational marijuana stores, which quickly gained well-deserved reputations for both subpar pot and outrageous prices, want to clear the field of their pesky, read, usually superior in both price and quality, competitors on the medical side. Nobody's surprised by the assault coming in the form of onerous bills from Republican State Senator Ann Rivers and Democratic State Senator Jean Cole Wells. Those are at least known enemies who have made no effort to hide their desire to kill collective gardens and dispensaries as we know them in Washington State. Rivers, in a near comic attempt to please everyone, proposed allowing dispensaries to stay open but banning dried marijuana sales at them. Rivers claimed her goal is to harmonize medical marijuana with I-502, but the real goal, of course, is to clear the field of competition for the recreational marijuana stores and the lucrative source of tax dollars they represent to state lawmakers. According to one source in the know, Rivers' original strategy was to get current medical marijuana dispensaries on board with her plan, but she also was listening to some 502 store lobbyists who still didn't want any competition. So they came up with a absurd no marijuana flowers in medical dispensaries idea. Holmes, for his part, came right out and said, if you're a commercial medical marijuana operation lacking a 502 license, it's a felony operation, period. That's not really a surprise coming from a guy who was such a big supporter of I-502 that he now wants to extinguish the competition. Damn few people really expected Allison Holcomb, as the author of I-502, to be honest about its potentially devastating effects on the patient community, nor on its farcically sputtering start. Equally unsurprising was the deeply unflattering spectacle of Holcomb using the press to urge raids and felony charges against medical marijuana dispensary operators. This from an activist who in November took the lead on a national ACLU campaign to slash mass incarceration rates which are, of course, driven by the very drug arrests that Holcomb is now urging. But what enters a whole other realm of unseemly greed is when the state director of the Washington Chapter of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, conspicuously makes himself a part of the chorus, calling for an end to medicinal cannabis as we know it. How shameless does someone have to be while calling himself an activist and simultaneously working to line his own pockets by forcing people to buy the expensive, underpowered weed in his 502 store. That's right, Kevin Oliver, who not only serves as state director, but also sits on Normal's national board, is the proud owner of an I-502 recreational marijuana store license, and he can hardly wait to become the only game in town when patients need their medicine. Oliver grandly announced in a January interview with the Cannabis Business Times that the first six months of I-502's implementation were, get this, a dress rehearsal. That would certainly come as interesting news to the I-502 license holders who have either gone out of business or struggled to survive. They could be forgiven for assuming their asses were on the line. But that isn't even the worst part of Oliver's bloviated, self-important interview. That would be where Oliver, supposedly an advocate, remember, for marijuana rights, claims that Washington patients won't suffer hardship if forced to buy weed at 502 stores at double or triple the price of dispensaries. And even while patients certainly will be suffering in such a scenario, a delighted Oliver will be laughing all the way to the bank. Yay normal. Never mind that recreational weed costs two, three, even four times as much as weed in medical collectives. Never mind that more than 200 pesticides are specifically allowed 
by name on state store recreational weed. Let's not think about the effects all those chemicals could be having on patients with compromised immune systems and liver function. And even while allowing all those pesticides, guess what? Washington State doesn't even test for them. Patients need, according to these folks, to pipe down and accept their fate, which apparently is acting as though they are indistinguishable from recreational marijuana users. Ironically, Kevin Oliver, who's now proudly sitting there on his 502 license, repeated ad nauseum back in the 2012 campaign that I-502 won't affect patients. Maybe in Oliver's mind, shutting down the collective garden dispensary system and forcing patients into the recreational model to pay two to four times as much for their badly needed medicine isn't affecting them. One must speculate whether it's greed or other factors that led a supposed activist to such callous disregard for human misery. Will greedy I-502 profiteers be able to persuade the Washington legislature to shut down their competition, the medical dispensaries? Stay tuned on that one. But with Native American cannabis sales coming soon to Washington and after that nationwide, it seems the recreational marijuana store owners are going to have a lot more to worry about than just the medical dispensaries. You can check out the print version of this article in the February issue of the Northwest Leaf, and it's also at topesignals.com. Moving to the next story, in Oregon, a group launches a new effort to defend marijuana legalization there, perhaps hoping to avoid the fate that seems to be befalling medical marijuana patients in Washington. The successful campaign to legalize marijuana in Oregon has launched a new effort to defend Oregon's marijuana law from those who are trying to undermine the measure. We want a marijuana policy that reflects the will of the people, said Anthony Johnson, chief petitioner for Measure 91. Instead of making major changes, the state first needs to get the basics of implementation right, like childproofing, labeling, testing, packaging, auditing, inspecting, taxing, licensing, and background checks. In places like Colorado, marijuana retail sales began before comprehensive rules for edibles and packaging were completed and in place, and that contributed to difficulties in rolling out the new marijuana law. We don't want to see that happen in Oregon said Liam Marr, who led the Moms for Yes on 91 group. New Approach Oregon, which was behind Measure 1, announced it will now work as the watchdog for the new marijuana law. From time to time, we will let you know when you, what you can do to make sure we finish the job and get Measure 91 implemented effectively, the group announced in a prepared statement. We will update you on what is happening with implementation and alert you about threats to Measure 91. Although two previous attempts to legalize marijuana had failed, Oregon voters in 2014 passed Measure 91 by a 12-point margin during a non-presidential election winning in 14 counties in the state. But there are some people who would like to take marijuana policy in a direction that's different from what Oregonians voted for. Among the proposals that have already been introduced or advocated are to repeal key parts of Measure 91. They want to change key parts of the medical marijuana system. They want to establish a tax system that would benefit criminals and allow a small group of politicians to unilaterally decide whether their community can opt out of a law Oregonians overwhelmingly supported. They want to hobble the entire statewide implementation process so that it's harder to win sensible marijuana policies in other states. New Approach Oregon does not represent any industry group, any special interest group, or any ideology, the group announced in a prepared statement. We represent the moderate middle, advocates for the sensible marijuana policy that a strong majority of Oregonians voted for last November. We want a better approach to marijuana. Now it's time to follow through by making sure that the better approach to marijuana gets implemented. Interesting story from Alabama this week where a state senator says he's tired of these people and he won't release a medical marijuana survey. That's right, an Alabama state senator this week proclaimed, I'm really tired of dealing with these people when pressed to release a doctor's survey he ordered, which was conducted by the State Medical Association. Oddly, Senator Jim McClendon, who at the time he ordered the study was chair of the House Health Committee, repeatedly denied ever ordering the survey in a telephone interview this week, reports Edward Birch at ABC 3340. Senator McClendon, who perhaps should seek a less stressful form of employment than public servant, said he had received emails from medical marijuana proponents for the past two years about the missing survey. I'm really tired of dealing with these people and this issue, McClendon said. Reporter Burtz later spoke with Representative Patricia Todd, 
who co-sponsored a bill during the last legislative session which would have legalized medical marijuana in Alabama. Representative Todd confirmed that Senator McClendon did issue the request for the medical marijuana survey. I was in McClendon's office one day, and one of the government affairs people for the medical association was in there, and we were talking about it, and he said, oh yeah, we did the survey, Todd said. Representative Todd said the Medical Association of the State of Alabama, MASA, refused to give her a copy of the complete survey. She said she had submitted a list of questions to McClendon to be included on it. Todd said she didn't know if McClendon had included her questions on the survey. I have never seen the survey, but I know it was done, Representative Todd confirmed. We had said there were a lot of doctors that supported the use of marijuana for medical reasons. They sort of challenged us, and somebody suggested we do a survey of doctors to find out. Nico Corley, spokesperson for MASA, claimed the results of the survey were inconclusive, according to the Montgomery Advertiser. Corley didn't explain why inconclusive results would justify burying the completed survey from public view. Corley never returned phone calls seeking an answer to that question. The survey definitely exists, and it is being kept from the public on purpose, according to Ron Crumpton, executive director of the Alabama Safe Access Project, ASAP, a group which supports medical marijuana. As of midday Thursday, ASAP's website had inexplicably been blacklisted by Google for malware, possibly as a result of being targeted by political enemies. Now, let me note, that's my speculation, not Ron Crumpton's, by the way. I was told by Representative Ron Johnson that McClendon ordered this survey, Crumpton said. It didn't come out, so that can only lead me to believe that it didn't go the way they wanted it to. Senator McClendon may not realize it, but it is his job as an elected representative of the people to listen to the people of Alabama about the issues important to them, Crumpton wrote on his personal website. The simple fact is that he has lied to the people who support this issue. He has tried to intimidate people who dare to raise their voice to support this issue by accusing them of harassment, and he used his authority as chairman of the House Committee on Health to kill multiple attempts to address this issue. I wasn't 100% convinced it would be in our favor, Representative Todd said of the survey, but when I couldn't get a copy of it after I kept asking and asking, then I came to realize it's probably really in our favor, and all of a sudden nobody knows anything about it. I find your statement about medical cannabis intolerable wrote Faye Medlock to Senator McClendon on Facebook Wednesday. We will not give up, nor will we give in. Calls to Representative Ron Johnson to confirm what he knew about the survey went unreturned. Interview requests with Senator McClendon were ignored. In the United States this week, an interesting survey said Florida is the worst state in the union for marijuana smokers. An informal survey shows that is the worst place to be if you want to toke up. Reporter Evan Anderson became curious about cannabis citations around the U.S. after reading a muckrock piece by Beryl Anderson on citation data from California marijuana arrests after decriminalization there. Copying the language used by muckrock user Dave Moss to get California's numbers, Anderson requested the same data from Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Massachusetts, Texas, Vermont, and Washington. Data from Washington and Colorado, both of which have legalized pot, were unavailable at the time of the request, and the Massachusetts Department of Criminal Justice never acknowledged his request. The number of marijuana citations given in Florida blows the rest of the states out of the water, Anderson reports. Part of that is due to the unfortunate fact that possession of more than 20 grams of cannabis in Florida is a felony, with a maximum punishment of up to five years in prison and a fine of up to $5,000. California, by contrast, has decriminalized possession of 28.5 grams or less of cannabis where such cases will get you a mere infraction with a maximum fine of $100, unless you're a minor, in which case you can get 10 days in jail and a fine of $250. Even after correcting for population, Florida is still far worse than the other states measured, giving marijuana tickets to one and 294 state residents in 2011. Arizona was the next worst state in the sample, issuing one citation to every 3,313 people in 2011. That shows you just what a difference. According to Arizona law, possession of any amount of cannabis is a felony with a maximum fine of $750 and a minimum sentence of four months in jail. Oddly, marijuana citations nearly doubled there between 2011 and 2012 and remained at that high level through 2014. Florida may be the sunshine state, but it's obviously got a long way to go before its citizens who choose to enjoy cannabis enjoy equal rights with everyone else. Before we go this week, we have a must-read on TopeSignals.com. 
It's a new monthly feature from activist Sherry Sicard, Cannabis Sherry. It's our Cannabis POW of the Month. Former Marine Larry Duke is serving life without parole for marijuana. And if you want to know more about that tragic case and how you can help, visit Pokesignals.com and check out our Cannabis POW of the Month. Until next week, stay lifted. See you then. <music>